I'm hungry. That traitor there, right over there, he's got the goods. Let's go get him. We can split everything three ways and feed our family for a month. There. Got everything. No, let's leave him. Leave him for dead. He had what belongs to us, and now it's ours. I knew it was a problem 
because I could hear the noise. I heard him coming. I tried my best self-defense skills, and they took me down, and it hurt. You probably wonder why I went down from Jerusalem down to Jericho. It's because my family used to take the salts from the Dead Sea and put them into pools, and then take the salt and sell them. We sold them all the way to Egypt and all the way up to Rome and far beyond. We used to have Samaritan traders come by and even trade our salts. We always made sure and washed our hands when the Samaritans left. Because you know about those Samaritans. So I had to go up to Jerusalem because my family not only gets occasional work with the salt, because the Romans took possession of the water and all that's in them, including the salt. And so now we have to work the salt pools that we used to own. And we are slowly starving to death. And so I went up to Jerusalem because a cousin of mine said that I could go and work a couple of weeks before Passover and a couple of weeks after, herding all the animals and the turtle doves and all the other stuff. And I saw from behind where all the money goes. I saw from behind the walls where nobody sees the Romans smiling at all the revenue. I saw from behind the walls the ways my religion was being taken and distorted to service Rome and to service power, to service harm. And I took the money. I took the money. I took the money and I headed down as early as I could leave and I came down around that bend and there they were. And my 16 denarii Half of what I hoped for was gone. Then I looked up and I saw the priest and I thought, surely she's going to help me. But she passed by. I fell asleep again, concussed. And I found myself awake and being tended to by a dirty Samaritan. I've lost our business that we had for thousands of years, I lost my economic security, I lost the dignity of my religion, and now I've been helped by a dirty Samaritan. Am I even going to tell my family what happened? I'm grateful, but I don't know. Stuyvesant on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Peter Stuyvesant representing the Dutch West India Company. Stuyvesant Town was a great place to grow up. My mother and three brothers still live in one of those apartments with 30,000 people there. Peter Stuyvesant was part of the regime that purchased the island of Manhattan for 60 guilders or $1,000 on the backs of the Lenape Indians, a thousand of whom were murdered when they tried to retain their fishing rights and ability to survive on that land. Peter Stuyvesant retired to 62 acres of a Bowery farm covering what is now Stuyvesant Town. When Stuyvesant Town was contemplated to be built by the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company in 1943 as a place for families after World War II was over, The proprietor considered 
working with the city to build the property and get tax breaks and to exclude anyone who was black from the neighborhood, which meant that the 11,000 residents of that neighborhood would not qualify to live in this modern apartment complex. This development was built with city funding and complicity, part of a regime that included redlining and other forms of discrimination throughout the United States. Only through community organizing was Stuyvesant Town integrated and the Fair Housing Act of 1968 was passed. The land on which we live has a story. How are we to be stewards of the land that we occupy? How are we stewards of the land that is only owned by God, part of God's creation, and for which we are to serve in service? One of the groups that was displaced when Stuyvesant Town was built was the first house of hospitality of the Catholic Worker Movement in Dorothy Day. Can we use our land today? Can we ally with impacted community to build our own houses of hospitality, to build our own houses of reparation? You know, I'm someone who, maybe like many of you, grew up in the church. And a lot of different types of churches. But to be honest, in the last few years, I have really struggled with the institutional church. And even the fact of stepping into what it means to be the priest was has been a struggle in the last 24 hours, to be honest. I love Jesus. I believe in the gospel and that it is life. And yet, time and time again, I don't see people passing by when there are this impact in my community and my story and in other places in this world, and specifically in my country. And this has been hard for me. And what I have found is, I think, even in the story of who is my other, what I realized over the last few years is the church, something that's been a part of me for so long, has become an other at times. And so I find myself wrestling with how do I, how do I continue to be present, to stay connected, to keep pushing for what we dream of, and what we hope for in this world. What does that look like? And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I want to take that other path from the church that's perhaps on the ground at times. I, I want to go around. Sometimes I don't even want to go down the road. It's like, hey, can we just go over there? Because I'm tired. It feels exhausting sometimes. And then where do you go to talk about that? And so, in this wrestling, and just being honest with you, looking for God, where and how are you moving here? And how might we, as a collective body, find these new journeys and pathways forward? And what does it look like for us to do that together? And so, I continue to wrestle with these questions of, what are the new encounters for me? Can I be open to new encounters, even within spaces that I grew up with? Do I have the imagination to believe that 
new things can come. New things can be birthed. And I want to keep saying yes to that. test of privileges, whether 10 or 14 or 40, I check them all off. I have them all. And yet, I would say that white Christian supremacy, which has amplified my hard work, because I'm a hard worker, with better opportunities and more pay, social status. The white Christian male supremacy has still robbed me. It's robbed me of seeing all my fellow human beings happy and secure and offering the best of their gifts, joyous at the end of a day's work in the park with their family secure in our neighborhood, offering their gifts to the world. It has robbed me also of my own humanity. Because as a white male cisgender person, I'm expected not to weep, 
Not to be hurt. I actually did pull a muscle coming in here. I can't be vulnerable. I'm not supposed to learn or be wrong or wonder or rest. Why Christian supremacy is stolen much from all of us. We don't have to live like that. We don't have to live like this. We just don't. We just don't. And so we ask the question, who is my neighbor? Who is your neighbor? When I look at the, the movement in the story, the movement of coming down from and going towards, movement of stepping away or stepping towards, movement of touching and tending and lifting. I wonder what in this story that Jesus used to talk about and to show who the neighbor was. What moves you? Where does it move you? Does it move you away? Is it too challenging? Does it move you toward? Does it move you up? Can you go down into those places that we've avoided looking at? Sometimes the gaping wounds that we never see. I invite you to ponder how the wound that you carry, the wound that we carry, can be a place of new birth, can be a womb, can be a seed, a covering, where we might find wisdom. Wisdom that moves us. Wisdom that grounds us. Wisdom that gets us off of our backside. And wisdom that causes us to sit down and rest. I ask you, who is your neighbor? How can you be a neighbor to you? And how can we be neighbors to one another? We don't need hope to answer questions. But we can wonder. And that, in the wound, is the wisdom. And in Luke, and in Luke, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. <clears throat> and Jesus said, go and do likewise. 